Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? If you can hear me, um, put it on up in the reaction too. Okay, should be fine now. All right, let's start. Oh, good afternoon, everyone from Chiang Mai University. We are right now at RCSD. And we are very lucky today to have Ellen Kirksey with us. So I will do a bit of a short introduction about us, the Amamundi Lab or the Amamundi Multi Species Ecological Worm Making Lab. We are a lab based here at Chiang Mai University working with RCSD and I see HI at the humanities faculty. We are intersectional multidisciplinary research lab in the global south, investigating how human and more than human and world making and survival opportunity table. Our aim is to grow knowledge making community by fostering dialogues and collaborations among disciplines spanning eco philosophy, humanities, art, science, and natural science through research, publications, workshops, curated conversation, art science exhibitions, multi species anography, which is our talk today, as well as innovative analogy. And um, we are very happy today to have you with us on Zoom and our friends here, which are lab members, um, to be listening to Evan. So before I continue to introduce Evan, I'd like to do a bit of a short land acknowledgement to um, those who come here before and many indigenous, especially indigenous communities. Um, whereas the context in places like Southeast Asia, we can't really specify which Native American group has been here before us, but we would like to acknowledge all the more than human and also indigenous communities who have been here with us before us and also here with us today. Um, so I'd like to do a bit of a short introduction to our speaker today. We are very lucky to have Evan Kirksey. He's an American anthropologist and a member of Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, um, New Jersey. He has also been published in many platforms, including um, conventionals, uh, newspapers like Sunday Times, The Atlantic, Guardian, Wired. He yeah, also um, been sought out as an expert in science and society by the Social Press, The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Democracy Now, Time, and the BBC, among many, many other media outlets. He has speaks widely at the world's leading academic institutions, including Oxford, Yale, Columbia, UCLA, and the International Summit of Human Genome Editing, plus many other music festivals, art exhibits, and community events. Um, Professor Kirksey holds a long-term position at Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia, and he is with us today at Chiang Mai University. And I will pass on the microphone to Evan and guide us through what it means to become one. So thank you for that uh, very generous introduction, Maria. And um, I, I should say at the outset, I'm here with a group of scholars um, in, in the room in Chiang Mai, and we've just uh, done some research together. So we've visited um temples like this one pictured on the slide here over the weekend and uh there's monkeys there it's not the same kind of monkeys as the one that i'm talking about today um, but what we're interested in at these sites is what we call or what we're starting to call life in narratives um we know that uh, there's bats and caves around many temples and um, that these bats can harbor coronaviruses and those can get into people but it seems like there's not much evidence of illness and suffering at these sites, but a sort of liveliness. Um, so what I'm going to try to do today is, is offer some resources to the, the group that's here in the room with me for thinking about these sites in Thailand by taking us to a very different place. Um, but before uh, I click off this slide, I, I want to just point out that what that uh, monkey is doing on um, the main slide is sniffing a bat. Um, can, can people hear me? I, I'm getting some feedback that uh, the audio is not working. Yeah, the sound yes, is sorry. Can, 
good evening, Suzanne. I, hello, are you in Berlin? Good to see you virtually. I, I, see, I see that it um, started from here. I'll, I'll wait before I get confirmation from, from Zoom. Okay, so some people, uh, we've got a complicated setup. Uh, spotlighted. No, I think if I unmute, it's going to break the system, right? So give me one of these microphones. Well, I haven't done anything yet, so hey. <laughs> uh, this is all new as of like a few days ago. I don't know what I'm doing. Just to just to let you know. <laughs> well, if it's working, let's see. It's, it's not, though. Yeah. It's working fine now? Yeah. Huh? It's working fine now. Okay. So I'm going to start from the top on the off chance that uh, you didn't hear what I said. A few minutes ago. So I'm, I'm here in Chiang Mai, Thailand, with a wonderful group of scholars, and we've just done some collaborative field work over the weekend at some uh, temples here in Thailand where there are monkeys, as you can see on the slide here, as well as bats. So if you look closely at my title slide, you see that there's a monkey sniffing a dead bat. And part of why we're here is because there's a lot of um, emergent scientific findings about coronaviruses that are circulating amongst bats and people and multiple other species. So we were entering into these, these contact zones to try to figure out what was going on. And so I'm going to take us away from Thailand for this talk, but I just wanted to try to situate this presentation in an ongoing and emergent research project and in collaboration with the Alpha multi-species world making lab here in Thailand. Um, this works. Okay, that's right. Um, so this is a picture of Isabella. She is a high-ranking monkey in one of the groups that um, I encountered in, in Florida. And um, this was taken by a, a retired John Deere uh, engineer who has become sort of a monkey whisperer. That's how he styles himself in Florida. And this, this is a picture that was taken right as he was doing something impolite. Um, he was trying to get too close to Isabella. It was right after a key dynamic. Um, uh, a key dynamic was taking place in this group. Um, Isabella had just um, kind of been deposed from a position of authority. But I'm presenting this picture to start with uh, to, to make one just broad observation about uh, uh, you know what it's what it's like to uh, do work with monkeys. Um, in this in this case, with rhesus and cats, um, there's norms of politeness. There's there's social norms that pertain to these worlds, and it's impolite to stare. So one of the things that's happening right here is that there's direct eye contact being made. This is a, a, a very direct threat. Um, so. Panning out from this particular uh, moment, uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to explore two broad questions. A lot of feedback in the room. I hope it's not, uh, it's going to sort of annoy me a little bit, but hopefully you can hear it on, on, on Zoom. So the, the talk is uh, exploring two broad questions. I'm asking uh, who benefits we bono when species meet? And also, what is at stake when humans and monkeys become well together? And at, at the outset, I'd like to unpack two of these key words in the title uh, becoming as well as wild. So, in the words of Deleuze and Guattari, becomings involve new kinds of relations that emerge with non hierarchical alliances, infectious affects, and the mingling of creative agents. Departing from Deleuze and Atari, whose ideas about the coming animal have been critiqued for misogyny, fear of aging, and an incuriosity about actual animals. At the news contact zones in Florida, I studied mixed emotions, the contagious delight and fear that is at play when primate species meet. You know, humans, we are primates, and I'm interested in how 
Um, the particular primates of the Silver River in Florida were interacting with these these species of monkeys. I was interested in how high excitement and high anxiety was jumping across the species interface. I was interested in how the monkeys have flourished in its shifting regimes of power. So this idea of wildness, the second uh, key word in my title, once was imagined to exist only beyond the reach of civilization and domestication in the popular imagination of Europe. In North America, where I'm thriving right now, uh, on the frontier, wildness was long regarded as something that should be tamed, subjugated, brought under control. Pushing past these visions of colonialism and empire, Sarah Franklin has described wild forms of life emerging within the domains of biotechnology. In Franklin's words, the new wild is a successor condition of the old wild, which meant non-domesticated. So you have things like wild geese or wild boar. But now we're seeing new forms of wildness that are emerging in spaces of over-domestication and hyper -cultivation. And this is something I've explored in the context of microbial life, in the context of my work on this curve. Um, and, and this new sense of the wild signifies something that is dangerous, risky, out of control. So you might talk about a wild idea or a wild night out. The geographer Rosemary Claire uh, Pollard talks about the notion of a wild that might be rehabilitated. But again, rehabilitating a concept from, from colonialism that we might use to recognize the autonomy and alterity of other species. The phrase wildlife, according to Collard, might refer to an uncaptive life that retains the ability to work for itself and others in its social and ecological networks. And those networks might include humans. Wild animals, Collard asserts, have the capacity for bodily flight, as well as the freedom to raise families of their own. So, so there's a sort of wildness that she was in. So basically, Rosemary Collard. Um, was working in these uh, situations where uh, so-called exotic animals had been rescued from smuggling operations. And she was interested in places where they were trained to be wild again, um, trained to sort of forage for themselves and be afraid of the humans. Um, but what should we make of this, this idea of wildness and what should we make in particular of wild animals in Florida? So I'd like to try to put this idea in context. So, so here in Thailand, you know, monkeys are kind of blase, cliche, that's what the tourists come to see. But, you know, in, in, in Florida, they hadn't been there for 12,000 years until humans interviewed, like wild monkeys in North America hey, wasn't I see them. until we brought them there. It'd be something like mm. having a, a wild herd of zebras yeah. running around the hills near, nearby in the forest. So it's, it's this unusual, it's unexpected out. site. Um, in the conservation approach to understanding the situation, um, you know, was, was basically the bit that didn't belong. But I, I was more interested in, you know, this, this situation of emerging ecology. You know, what, again, what is that state? These are here. They, they seem to have, in some ways, this ethical, um, uh, you know, they have a kind of wildness uh, 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 to raise families of their own. They have the capacity to kind of like move and move around so the domination. So again, uh, this key question that this pop will explore today is who benefits we own of when species meet. So I'd like to start with the most famous wild monkey or infamous wild monkey uh, in Florida, who uh, entered the national media spotlight shortly after it was discovered in 2009. It was rooting through a strip mall dumpster near Tampa, Florida, picking through the trash from a variety of casual dining establishments. There was a Bennigan's in the shopping complex, a Panda Express, and a Chipotle. And a reporter for the New York Times Magazine, John Llewellyn, said no pet macaques were reported missing in Tampa Bay. There wasn't even anyone licensed to own one of these monkeys in the media area. And, and John Llewellyn was, was careful in this reporting. He noted that pet monkeys are usually timid when they escape into unfamiliar urban environments. Escape pets often get killed in traffic when they race into the cars or try to grab the power lines. But this monkey that was rooting through the trash appeared calm, 
and he retreated into a nearby tree for a nap as people crowded around the dumpster. There was a no local trapper who came to the scene. He loaded a tranquilizer dart into his rifle, and at that point, the monkey jolted awake and swung out of the canopy and hit the ground running. It made it for the neighborhood office park where it catapulted across a roof and reappeared, sitting smugly in another tree, only to vanish again. Newspapers and television journalists began to track mon monkey sightings, calling him the mystery monkey of Tampa Bay. As some locals began to clandestinely feed him, others expressed outrage, citing public safety and environmental concerns. An enterprising businessman started a Facebook page. Which attracted over 85,000 fans. People began posting photos of their encounters with the monkey, reporting on his brushes with the law, promoting their own businesses with this local website, TampaBayMedLife.tv. Supporters of the monkey cheered with their Facebook posts Stay safe, mystery monkey. Keep on the move. Don't let him catch you. Go, monkey, go. So the trapper was named Burn. And he developed this personal vendetta for the mystery monkey. He darted the monkey several times, but the monkey would just take the dart out, throw it to the ground, and apply to the punch and fall tree to sleep it off. He basically learned how these, these darts and tranquilizers worked and came up with his own adaptive behavior. As the drama continued, the Paul Bear report that Comedy Central lampooned the the hapless Florida authorities with a special televised feature. Macaque attack, 1,381 days of simian terror in Tampa. Following the mystery monkey from national media scapes to suburban landscapes, I found that many other rhesus macaques, and the scientific name is Macaca mulata, were living in Florida's fragmented wolf woodlands. I began to study encounters among primates, again asking, we bono, who benefits from species meet? What is at stake when humans and monkeys become wild together? So this is Bob. This is the guy who I mentioned at the very beginning, this retired John Deere engineer from Iowa, and he studies these monkeys as a citizen scientist. He lives in a peculiar community. It's called the, the villages. It's, it's only live there if you're over 65. There's 80,000 people who live in the village. So 98% white and 95% Republican. This is a gated community that was created to have everything that the retirees desire golf courses, shops, grocery stores, post offices, and hospitals. In the words of NPR's Robert Siegel, in the villages, when you speak about being convenient, that means golf cart accessible. The other one grabs your own buildings and there's personal golf carts that are all tricked out with their own special decorations. Um, one fun fact about the villages it's one of the fastest growing rates uh, of sexually transmitted diseases in the United States. These are elderly people who are enjoying a new lease on life and uh, <laughs> having fun. <laughs> Bob's wife enjoys line dancing with her friends and has an active social life in the villages. Bob is more at home on the Silver River, where he hangs out with the monkeys. Bob sees his job as serving as an intermediary between the social worlds of the macaques and people. He aims at creating uh, what I would call, you know, in conversation with Deborah Bird Rose, a quiet form of wildness, a form of wildness that demands tact and care. Bob told me, in macaque societies, it is impolite to stare. Eye contact is threatening. Direct eye-to-eye -eye contact means I challenge you. I'm the boss around here. Or can we stop that because you're communicating by staring something? In most cases, eye contact between humans and monkeys means I challenge you, he says. Of course, that wouldn't be wise, he wrote in a report about the monkeys for the local officials. The wise action is to look away, which means I don't want any trouble, or I accept the fact that you're the boss. This is, again, all, all of Bob's words here. If you see a monkey with the mouth open, corners the mouth forward, and ears back, those are signs of a serious threat. 
Dermatologists who studied uh, macaque behaviors and written these documents called ethograms basically inventory these behaviors. And what Bob just described is what is technically called an open mouth threat. Standard inventories of aggressive behavior also include branch shaking, so it's the yawn threat, the head bop threat. And then there's more subtle behaviors that include the eyelid flash, the silent bare teeth display, or fear grimace, also the lip smack. So these are all modes of communication here. Bob also introduced me to some of his monkey friends. He had been studying the monkeys along the Silver River over five years, paying very careful attention to the history and political dynamics of four distinct groups. He named groups A, B, B, and E. He thought that there was an F, but it appeared to not actually be a group, but he kept the group name of E. Bob developed a knowledge of these groups as he recorded their movements, made general behavioral observations, and studied the personality of individual animals. So that research that I did on the Silver River, um, like the research that we did here this weekend, was very much the product of field work with friends. And so I was working with the ethnoprimatologist Erin Riley from San Diego State University, um, her master's student, Tiffany Wade, and Elon Mabrell, who was at that point working on a PhD with me and has since completed a excellent book uh, called uh, Saving Animals. Uh, the primatologists on the team use standard ecological techniques to quantify the frequency of the behaviors that some of the behaviors that I just described, and they published that as an independent uh, uh, essay. And um, we were using descriptive, descriptive methods um, to characterize the dynamics of the human monkey interactions in the Silver River. This became a, a place where I was testing out some of my, and this is field work I did a while ago. Right, so I was testing out some of the um, approaches that you might use for multi species ethnography. I, I was very much a student during this, this uh, project. You know, I, I learned about macaque behavior 101 from, from uh, Tiffany and Eric. And there's several power dynamics at work, and we've talked about this, this here as, as we observe them in interesting Thailand. So um, it used to be once upon a time, all the primatologists were white men, and they, you know, they can easily see there's this man out in front, the alpha male, it's all about him. But it, it turns out um, it's much more complicated than subtle. So um, basically that, that alpha male is held into place by a coalition of, of females who kind of determine whether or not they want him around and are going to permit him to kind of you know, uh, uh, masculine and shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, as, as you grow up, if, if, if you're a boy monkey, you get chased off at a certain point. You'll, you'll see, at least in rhesus macaque troops, you'll see subadult males, but once you become an adult, you're shoot off, and um, you, you might form like a peripheral group of marauding males that, that are going around. Um, the males uh, try to join new groups and um, usually follow a seniority rule, and the ranks rise as other males leave or die or get forced out. The top ranking female is dominant over all other females and males, with the exception of the alpha male. But there are very complicated nested hierarchies, too, and there's one surprising thing that you wouldn't expect unless you pay a lot of careful close attention. And Feminist principles, and, and the, the third, uh, uh, the third highest ranking member of the racist attack society is the alpha female's youngest daughter. So alpha male eats first, alpha female eats second, the daughter eats eats third, and all of the other big monkeys have to wait. And if they mess with that baby monkey, they get the shit. <laughs> So drawing on this interdisciplinary expertise, again, with Eric Riley and Tiffany Wade, I began to characterize the dynamics of human monkey interactions in the Silver River. We found the packs using in-flight gestures from their own social worlds to generate behaviors they desired from humans. 
And it's for one of the key questions in the paper, again, in benefits, we don't know in species beat. We found evidence of power plays in parallel social worlds. In order to describe one scene, um, we're just going to go straight to the fun part, which is among these diatomic groups. I'm just going to describe this event that we saw um, with a family feeding beans and bananas. One Sunday afternoon, a family in the blue motorboat fed group eating grapes. We were observing particularly interesting dynamics as human norms about feeding wildlife interacted with the pack rules about access to food. Monkeys were jumping among the trees, clambering around the exposed roots of red maples and cypress trees as grapes sailed out across the river. Three adult females were at the edge of the water among the reeds and tree roots. Almost all of the grapes were falling into the water. Scar and the alpha male lurked behind the tree, looking over a small gaggle of yearlings scattered on the riverbank. Dad, who was wearing a, a blue jacket, sunglasses, and a black baseball cap, threw grapes while dangling his leg over the side of the boat. Aiming at a small cluster of monkeys on the other side of the river, he said, I hope they all see the food and jump in. George, the oldest son, then around 11 years old, followed suit and started chucking grapes too. As the females and yearlings started sifting through the reeds and the monkey bottom for grapes, which sank rather than floated, Mary, an off-duty ranger from the state park, approached and kayak out of the next stream. Please don't throw things at them, Mary said, as she approached this blue motor boat. Dad replied, we're feeding them grapes. Please don't feed the monkeys, Mary continued. Why, asked Dad, not good. Ask the researchers, Mary implored. Mom looked at us, and we shrugged. They don't care, said Mom. <laughs> <laughs> The state park definitely does. Mary fired back. It's kind of against our rules. As we became implicated in a dispute between the subjects of our study and the park staff, and we had permission to be there from the park manager's boss to you know, observe what was going on, a, a juvenile belly flopped into the water, dive bombing a grape, spotted on the bottom of the river. Another yearling cooed. He was also studying the situation, carefully watching the dynamics and the people and also the dynamics within his own social world, hoping to score a tasty grape. As Scar looked away, the youngster looked right at George, the boy who had been throwing grapes. Reaching polite norms in the pack society, the young monkey returned George's gaze and softly pooped, begging or perhaps daring him to make another toss, reaching across gulfs of biology and meaning. Looking down at her son and then at Mary, Mom asks, well, why? Why shouldn't we keep the monkeys? Mary, the park ranger, said, it's the food chain. If you're feeding the monkeys, then you're feeding the fish, and then pretty soon the alligator will get it, and when an alligator sees a human, after a tense interchange, Mary continues upstream. She was basically on her day off. She was trying to enjoy day paddling. She got entangled in this, this hunt, but and you know, she was speaking fast, and in the moment I didn't really understand what she was saying, but what she was trying to say is that there was a becoming happening, and animals were becoming vulnerable. So she invoked an alligator, and you know, I, I learned that monkeys routinely get eaten by alligators, and those babies uh, bombing um, the grapes were at risk. You know, there was gators all over the place in Florida, and I, I, you know, I was paddling with a canoe. Once, once there was a gator almost as big as my canoe, it was like straight down the stream. It, it wasn't going to get out of the for me. So, you know, these are big gators. But it was also a more subtle message. So, after I talked to that park director, boss, Sally, and tried to debrief that encounter, I understood that the alligators were vulnerable. So, if an alligator starts associating people with food, that animal is going to get destroyed. So every year there's around 10,000 alligators that are killed because they're perceived as threats to, to humans. So, so in this contact zone, you know, if, if you pay a little bit of attention, you recognize that, okay, that sometimes monkeys become vulnerable in these other species and countries. But if you really step back and think about these dynamics at play, it's also the predators that are at risk in this era of you know, human-dominated 
landscapes. And you know, humans occasionally have been killed by my computers in Florida. They've been trying to kill their attacks since 1948. This is totally out of proportion to the violence that's been perpetuated towards this particular land. After Mary found the bend in the river, the yearlings continued to die upon the graves. We notice facial expressions hinting at mixed emotions and ambivalent feelings in people and monkeys. Unequal risks were clearly at play in overlapping multi species worlds. Small monkeys were in the water, humans were safely in the boats, and alligators nearby were at risk of becoming a nuisance. As George, the eldest son, continued to break park rules by tossing grapes towards the monkeys, he sustained the situation in asymmetrical risk, where the usual impact social rules were temporarily suspended. Rules giving alpha males and females priority access to food broke down in the zone of risk near the water. Star circled the cypress tree roots, seeking access to an occasional, occasional grape landing on firm ground. But Scar did not venture into the water. It was the younger men who were perhaps lacking the experience to fully understand the potential dangers of this sort of situation. They were the ones able to store the choice food in this encounter. Shallows, Ultimately, this encounter and most of the other interactions we observed on the Silver Silver River turned out happily for all involved. All the thought of a comedy. When the previous week that they didn't like in mind, monkeys received food, no one was hurt, no punitive fines were issued by our staff. The interaction took the form of a plateau. And this is what the Elizabeths. Uh, the Tariots five is a pitched intensity of interaction that never reaches a climax. Proximity to humans and shadowy specters in the water enabled young macaques and a young boy to become a little bit flat. Gravity to find autonomy and freedom in a space yielded to them by domineering elders and state officials. In becoming wild, macaques and humans were inducing each other to disrupt power hierarchies. While participants in this particular event were relatively restrained, we observed other encounters that became increasingly intense, where redoubling loops of affects and emotions spiraled towards climax. Infectious feelings began to quickly jump among people and monkeys, while counter encounters began to spin out of control. As the buzz of a motorboat sent vibrations down the river, several adult female macaques sat at attention and scanned the distance. We were observing a group, the group with Star and Broken Leg, which had grown to 48 macaques. As the motorboat approached on the lower section of the Silver River, this was in a place where the park rangers were at the venture. It's the Wild West out there, one ranger had told us. The yearlings were play fighting and chasing one another from tree to tree. Scar was being elusive, resting in the shade of a saw palmetto, taking a break from eating the buds of Carolina ash along the south side of the river. Twenty monkeys, led by King, King Philip and Queen, Queen, Queen Isabella, uh, Bob's names for the day, were scattered across the river's north shore among the pumpkin ash and red maple. As the buds reverberated in the water and in our bodies and through the groups of macaques, we shared a sense of heightened excitement. The buzz was from a red motorboat driven by a man in a cowboy hat. He was wearing board shorts. The lighted shouts rang out. Ooh, the, a baby monkey. Let me see. I, I have a video. Oh, no, it's, it's going to play it now. No, three is not. Yeah. I'm just going to go back. Uh, so there's a, a video that basically illustrates all these. Interactions and um, which takes the line. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it, there's no blood, but it's a little bit intense. Um, so the sub adult male, um, like they're feeding, they're feeding, they're feeding, they're feeding like oranges, they're checking like uh, Cheetos, like, you know, it's like all kinds of like, you know, Twinkies, everything. It's like all kinds of stuff. So it's one sub adult male also like got an orange. Wasn't supposed to, but according to the, the social rules, we would see first like that little guy was trying to get away with something. 
Um, after he grabbed the order and the adult female closest to him grunted in opposition and lunged towards him. He turned and ran inland, or in hand, four higher ranking females recognized this young boy's transgression and started to put him in his place. Grunting, they chased him up and back down trees. The grunting became louder, more intense, more rapid as they all hit the ground running, hidden from view. Amidst the bedland, the young male emitted a sharp cry, probably in response to a bite. The birds stopped, toss stopped tossing fruit and stared blankly while the grunts and cries continued. Hey, God! A man screamed, I'm the man! Hey, go home! And then his family chimed in with chimpanzee sounds. <laughs> so what in this, this keyword of colonialism, again, was once only done in ancient civilization in the popular imagination of Europe. On American frontiers, it was something to be tamed, subjugated, brought under control. My research in Florida was taking place as capitalism was becoming increasingly wild and schizophrenic. A slow wave of home foreclosures was uh, uh, sweeping through the state. Someone wants to get in. Um, white nationalists were also becoming increasingly unruly and wild. Trayvon Martin, an unarmed African American boy, was murdered by a white vigilante while I was conducting research on the Silver River. Wild farm labor practices were exacerbating histories of dispossession in the Caribbean plantation economy, generating dangerous, dangerous and risky modes of life. Florida has become a wild country where deeply rooted colonial legacies interact with novel forms of wild. The state park falls within the congressional district of Richard Nugent, a former sheriff who was sworn into office as part of the Tea Party Caucus on January of 2011. If someone was bitten again by a monkey, they would just ring up their congressman, and the authorities would come in here with their guns blazing, said one self identified Democrat on the park staff on the condition of anonymity. Heads would roll in the park administration, and the monkeys would be gone. Someone who I called John Daniels, a former park ranger and proud National Rights Association member, uh, offers a face to this white wildness in Florida. John is a Tea Party activist who describes himself with self deprecating humor. I'm a redneck, John told us, but not the kind of redneck that goes shooting things indiscriminately, even, even if I am hungry. Well, we are Looking for wild monkeys on the Silver River, John paddled his sit on top kayak, telling us about the rich landscape, the columns that with layer upon layer of cultural and natural history, pointing to a big cypress tree with a distinctive wide fork of branches. This is the place where they filmed the original Tarzan movie in 1932. It turns out the story of, of wild monkeys on the river, many people attributed to Tarzan. Um, so this is you know before the color. This is like the first one. Um, so there's a, a, a Tarzan tree with a famous flying swing, which was actually a, a, a piece of metal. Um, the story of their origin is a whole complicated side story, but I'm going to stick to um, my wild man, my white wild man there for a second. So, so that particular tree with the distinctive white fork, uh, John said, probably sprouted in the 15th century based on the slow growth habit of the species. He said that the cypress tree has stood as a silent bystander for hundreds of years of human history as the Ocali Indians piled shells into mid middens as violent skirmishes erupted with the first white settlers, as local men and goods were channeled to Confederate forces during the Civil War, and as the colored only beach was established just under the tree at Paradise Park. Oh, that's not the side I was expecting, sorry. That's the side I was expecting. Turns out my wild man from Florida was helping capture monkeys. Um, he saw them as invasive species. Um, he was selling them. Um, they fetch up to $15,000 per monkey um, to be used in laboratory research. That slide's not a a little bit of context for who this guy is. And here he's going to tell a joke. The Tarzan movies feature. 
an ape man swinging from this tree by a vine he was telling me about. In 1986, this vine had become rusty and frayed, so John cut it down. If you tie it, if you tried to use it, you'd rip yourself to pieces, he said. And it was basically big. There's not like shards of metal sticking out from it. The Tarzan tree now stands right next to a canal that was dredged at the end of segregation when the African American beach, Paradise Park, was destroyed. John pointed out a couple of exotic palms and see in old Paradise Park postcards. There's a queen palm with palm spikes so that makes the bronze. After pointing this out, John mobilized the figure of an animal to illustrate his political sensibilities with a racist joke. He said, How have you been doing, Tarzan? Well, oh, I'm getting a little old. My knees, my knees are feeble. I can't swim in a vine like I used to. How's Jane doing? She's got Alzheimer's and doesn't even know who I am anymore. But how oh boy? Well, Boyd never really make it. He got into drugs and then went out to South America and was in psychedelic land. But oh well, sorry to hear that. But what about Cheetah Tarzan? Cheetah moved into the White House. This was during the Obama era. Chasing after a baby alligator, grabbing it by the tail, John suddenly brought us into a situation where risk, danger, and chance could have easily resulted in. Accident. After letting the alligator go, he talked with boyish glee about how he enjoyed escaping the homegrown nature of civilization on the Silver River. The actual violence of grappling with the baby alligator matched the symbolic violence of John's Tarzan joke. A trailer park in Forest, a nearby town that some claimed was named for the first Ku Klux Klan Grand Wizard, Nathan Bedford Forest, had a No Niggers Allowed sign hanging at the entrance when I visited there in the late 90s. 149 known mentions of blacks were recorded in Florida during the first half of the 18th century, from 1900 to 1945. Wild white men like John Daniels are now free to masquerade as frontiersmen in the parts of his own net stomping grounds. With modern life made men physically and morally soft, and this is in the words of Daniel Brad Bradbund, the scholar of Tarzan, circumscribed and independent, Tarzan is the imaginary antidote. On Silver River, John Daniels demonstrates his masculine physical prowess and mastery over unseen creatures. As a park ranger, a former park ranger, he was also free to attack and kill unknowns, buffering the vulnerable homeland in the later. John, um, so I, this is this was like an undercover sting operation to figure out the dynamics of monkey smuggling. It was a tightly guarded secret. I guess it cracked up in this network, and um, there was a, a trapper named Scott Chestnut who uh, was featured in the media right as we were showing up to do field work. And initially, when we arrived on the scene, the animal rights activists thought that we were somehow associated with them. So it took a lot of uh, you know, talking and negotiation um, you know, to get people like you know, Bob to initially talk with them. But I also managed to get the smugglers and the people who were helping out um, the smugglers to to First, one long-time local resident, this trapper usually arrives in town without telling anyone. It's like an undercover sting, said my employment. A woman who insisted that on meeting me late one night at the cabin above a bar, a bar that's frequented by hunters in the Talamash Forest. He hires a driver as well as a river guide who helps locate the trapped monkeys on the river. Once everything is in place, just like goes out after dark and strategically places traps along monkey trails in the points. There's a place where the bridge forces the monkeys close to the river. And after he places the traps, he goes up to check them. He was often switching his boat, switching his attire, not only trying to evade detection by people, but the monkeys also recognize him. So he's trying to disguise himself with the monkeys. There's an undercover uh, network of monkey lovers there run by Tish Hennessy, and um, Tish is featured in Elon Abel's book. Um, she runs the sanctuary, all the sanctuary. So, Highly recommend Elon's account of, of um, 
you know, that, that uh, operation. But yeah, my, my anonymous source says Scott Cheslap is very private. I don't work with him all the time. I think he asks me to. It's all, 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 often like she, she gets a call a day or two and then it's pretty short to work with him. As I sat down with this woman and see some tracker, she revealed this deep sense of ambivalence about her work with this monkey. Hunter. She told me about watching a mama who had just lost a son or a daughter. When they lose a family member, that pisses them off. They don't like that, she said. She initially, initially implied that monkeys quickly recover, saying, quote, they seem to accept it and then move on. But then in the next breath, without any prompting from me, she said, I don't think that they ever get over morning. You know that occurs to gorillas, the higher primates, but even these little guys, you get to see what I would call sadness. And then she went on to describe a particularly sad incident. Once she and Chuck Slack got a mother monkey in a hog trap and the baby refused to leave. It just didn't know any better, she said. Instead of scrambling up a tree or running away, it just stood there, tugging at the cage, trying to get at its mother. A hawk was attracted by all this commotion. As Chuck Slack and my uh, informant stood there watching, the hawk swooped in and pulled the baby, dragging it off to eat. While the mother jumped up and down inside of the cage, she said the whole truth was going to be a show. All these pieces of photographers from the outset have worked to get beyond the notion of the non-human. Following Susan Lee Star, we have assumed non-human is like non-white. It implies the lack of something. Recently, Alexander Rubier reinforced this point as it applies to people. Rubier describes how racializing assemblages to divide up groups of people into full humans, not quite humans, and non humans. People who are marked by racial assemblages are routinely abused or killed. They have no standing before the law. The notion of the non human often subjects people, plants, and animals to slow violence, marking categories of life as expendable. External to the value system of capitalism. Communities confined to the realm of fair life, so, are routinely exposed to toxic chemicals, infectious diseases, and are sometimes targeted for outright destruction. Congressman Nugent, the Tea Party guy who I mentioned earlier, entered the national spotlight in July 2014 for his opinions about undocumented immigrant children. On the local radio talk show, Nugent made a disparaging comment about Mexicans. These kids have been brought up in a culture of Hebrew, he said, a culture of murder, a culture of rape. Indigenous peoples worldwide have lived with racial assemblages that are unkillable. Ongoing processes of dispossession, displacement, and genocide are taking place in human worlds as animal and plant communities are rendered into so called natural resources for extractive industry. As a picturesque backdrop for tourism. Tim Talbert notes that recent critiques of settler colonialism, quote, clearly linked violence against animals to violence against particular humans who have historically been linked to less than human or animal status. So I think it's, it's possible to build on the work of Deborah Bird Rose and get beyond this violence of white settler communities. Think about how wildness in the context of Australia came to previously stable places. So in contrast to wild country of the frontier, Deborah Bird Rose describes some language, some landscapes as quite a quiet country. Um, and it's the colonial exploitation and national development that have basically sort of um, created conditions where the life of the country is falling down into gullies, washing away with rains. And while the roads in this context is existing in places trammeled by capitalism. Wildness is a potent yet ambivalent term that can be used to make strategic interventions. Theorizing the wild is a means to supporting autonomy, recognizing the alterity of other species, 
wild animals that flourish with freedom from control or forced proximity to humans is a kind of wildness that left to embrace. Wildness fits as a concept with quickly oscillating emotions involving excitement, fear, elation, trepidation. It is often associated with encounters with like minded animals in multi species worlds. Wildness also fits as grounded theory for understanding contemporary discourse and practice in Florida related to environmental preservation, libertarian politics, and economic systems. And I think that Bob again is, you know, he's living this complicated landscape. When he read a draft of his paper, he quibbled with me on some things. He said, Trayvon Martin, you know, that, that guy was acquitted of charges. Um, you know, he's, he's living in, in this white community where people of color are gardeners or a higher color. But at least in the context of these monkeys, I think Bob is doing some interesting He's um, teaching people how to interact in, in ways that sort of keep themselves safe as, as well as the monkeys. So he's also part of this, this underground monkey network that is actively policing the river, trying to make sure that the trappers of the got chest on it, they're not using the trap to kill these animals. By blocking those attempts to call the one trap, wayward forms of life, monkey advocates like Bob mm -hmm. are opening up conversations about the top politics and categories of belonging. We're doing work to create a space for the quiet forms of violence. These naturalists and citizen scientists are learning how to care for the damage on the Great Florida and its long legacies of violence and intellectual change. With that, I will. We might have to turn off the mic one more time. Do you have to this? Let's just zoom only and fill the sound system in the room because it's not working anymore. Yeah, <laughs> it's that would be All right. That's so, what I actually thought we were going to do. In the let's first. do that. That's what everyone needs to do in the first place. Let's Maybe. do it. Because this is. That would be, yeah, it's horrible. Not Thank you. Okay. So does that mean you can turn it this case? Do I need to listen to one more time? Don't turn on your crazy echoes. Yeah. Hello? Okay, no crazy echoes. Yay. <laughs> so questions. Uh, I'm not the, or I'm one of the hosts. Can uh, someone turn on Blake's mic? Okay, just want to make sure I'm not uh, going with your mind. You're good. Yep. All right, cool, cool, cool. Um, uh, not so much a question, just uh, I'd love it if you could go into more detail on, uh, you mentioned Bob uh, working to prevent uh, trappers. Um, you can also turn on your video so people can see. Oh, wonderful. Uh, da -da -da -da. All right, hello, hello. Um, uh, I'm wondering if you can go into more uh, of the modes of resistance that you may have identified, um, whether from you know people like Bob who are we're doing work to prevent trappers from uh, taking the monkeys away from their homes and their families, uh, but also potentially from the monkeys themselves, have they developed modes of defense uh, within their communities that have allowed them to stay safe, uh, mm -hmm. and how do they work together to ensure mutual uh, safety? Yeah, so. Um, we can talk about hegemony. <laughs> so um, there was a moment in Florida's history where the state government became determined to eradicate these, these monkeys. And that was in the 1980s. Um, so this was from the Fish and Wildlife Office. And um, at that point, like there was a coordinated response from the state government and they were exploring a lot of different things. Part of what I didn't describe is one reason this population boomed is that there was an amusement park there that was feeding the, the troops twice a day with monkey chow. And um, so right next to that place where I showed you the Tarzan swing, there's like, you know, alligators and uh, like low key amusement park rides and glass bottom boat tours. So they were actively feeding the monkeys. So that created this massive population boom. You had monkeys uh, going to the local gas station, begging for food. Uh, it, it, 
by many accounts, it was out of control. Um, so at that point, the state, uh, you know, became determined to eradicate, kill, um, get rid of these alien invaders. Um, a number of different plans were floated, like some of them just wanted to kill them, some of them, uh, yeah, basically thought that um, sterilization was the way to go, a more humane approach. Um, others saw like value added to sell these animals in, um, as, as research animals. Um, at that point, Tish, um, the person who I briefly mentioned, Tiff, Tish Hennessy, who's featured in Elon Abril's um, Saving Animals book, she organized this big grassroots movement. You know, this is before the internet. This is when you had like zines, and these are people living in, in trailer parks at that point. Um, so at a certain point, Tish organizes a petition and takes it all the way up to Tallahassee, where the, the uh, legislature was sitting in session. She collected 10,000 signatures on a petition, and she said that the monkeys were, or sorry, the, the monkeys, the uh, legislators were acting like monkeys when she came in and just like kind of making fun of the whole issue. Um, she took the box and let it go, and it made this big thump, and they all quieted down. And she delivered this, this, um, this plea for, um, you know, her, her sanctuary is called All Creatures Sanctuary. So, she, so it's an animal rights um, framework to say that, you know, all creatures belong. Um, since that time, monkeys have become baked into the local structures of power. And anyone who tried to get rid of the monkeys today would be on a like political death <laughs> wish, you know, that they would get voted out of office. And there's also been some interesting changes in policy in Florida um, towards so-called exotic animals. Um, I met some of the officials uh, in the state and wildlife um, uh, department at their exotic pet amnesty day. So there's a big problem with people buying Burmese pythons and parakeets and water dragons and all kinds of things. And, you know, something doesn't work out, you're, you get a divorce, um, your kid goes to college and isn't there to take care of the animal anymore, they get turn, turned out uh, into the wild. So the state, instead of, um, you know, trying to do unaffected campaigns aimed at trapping or, or killing all these animals, like, it, it, it basically it figured out that it's impossible. So in the history of Florida, there's been one successful eradication of an unwanted animal. This is the Gambian pouch rat, which carries a disease, and it was confined to one island off of the Florida coast. So they were successful in that case. And it was like a scorched earth campaign targeting this one place. I think there was a couple um, endangered animals that the Gambian pouch rat was also bothering. So there was a clear justification. And basically at this point, the state has decided um, it's impractical to try to um, get rid of the monkeys, basically from a political standpoint, as well as from a logistical standpoint. Um, I interviewed some law enforcement officials who were convinced that with all these new technologies and helicopters and heat sensing devices that they would be able to track the monkeys. And they're, they're basically, there's, there's three groups in the Silver River State Park that are really interested in people and interested in people's food. There's also at least two groups on the Aklawaka, Akla, I'm gonna bungle the name of this river. So the Silver River feeds into a, a larger river, the Aklawaha is how you say it. So on the Aklawaha, there's at least two groups that my team was able to find that are really not at all interested in people. They're off foraging, they're eating plants, they're eating insects, they're eating all kinds of other things. And if they see a person, they, they just like turn in, into ghosts. So, um, and in, you know, in talking to these trappers who have like, you know, the law enforcement officials know nothing about what's going on here, but the, the actual trappers who I was able to interview said like, look, even if we wanted to eradicate, catch all these monkeys, like I would not be able to do it, um, even if I had a lot more manpower. So, so yeah, um, we can think about hegemony as being, um, you know, it's, it's about like how, how power works and you can have counter hegemonic struggles and get something established as a new orthodoxy. And that's what Tish and Bob and others have done. They've established the presence of monkeys in Florida as the orthodoxy that to challenge that, it would take a lot of political work.
Have a question? Let's see. Start a video. Hmm. Okay. It's not starting. I, I will do your video too. Yeah, I was trying. Let's see. Can you see me? Yes. Um, so, you know, you, you spend time in Florida doing research on monkeys. Um, you just spent some time with us together in Thailand. Uh, and I'm not sure if probably it wasn't the first time that you were encountering monkey in Thailand, but I was wondering um, after these three, four days, you know, uh, what if there are things that you that you saw, that you learn, or that add, adds value on top of what you've done in Florida, and of maybe uh, brought some new ideas, or maybe 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 change your mind on certain things. Uh, looking at how you know people here uh, interact with monkeys compared to that part of the world in Florida, and some close encounter that maybe you didn't have in Florida. That you had, yeah. Yeah. So. Before I answer that question, I want to give you broader context about other monkey encounters and ethnoprimatology work that's been done in other places. So Augustine Quintes, John Knight, um, Aaron Riley, who I already mentioned, have done work in various kinds of, of encounters. So Augustine's work in Bali uh, is, is and, and we might, let's, let's also talk about monkey herpes. So <laughs> periodically there's a, a journalist in Florida who gets a hold of the fact that the monkeys in Florida have simian herpes. And if you get it as a person, it can kill you. Um, there've been no documented cases of it being transmitted in Florida from these, this wild uh, group, um, but in laboratory contexts, um, when you know monkeys are stressed, they're shedding viruses. Um, it has been transmitted, and it can kill you. So, so let's let's think about viruses for a second with with monkeys, and let's think about um, the ways that different um, contact zones are structured by by technologies, by space. So, the 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 situation that I was describing in Florida is mediated by boats. I was always in a boat. The tourists were always in a boat. There was a very clear sense of like, you know, monkeys belong on land, people belong in boats. As soon as you get out of your boat and go on to land, the monkeys split. Um, in Bali, it's really different. Um, there's sort of a, a collaboration or a collusion between the tourist guides and the monkeys to like steal the glasses of the tourist or steal the camera or steal the wallet. And it's not that the, the guides are, um, you know, taking the stuff that the monkey steals and bringing it home, they're giving the tourists food, selling them food so that they can lure the monkey back to get their coveted thing um, from the monkey. Um, in those kind of situations, the monkeys are climbing all up over people, putting their hands in their faces. Um, similar kinds of contacts are happening in Gibraltar where um, there's a couple places by the side of the road where you routinely get these selfie pictures of, you know, me and my monkey friend sitting on my shoulder. Um, the Japanese uh, monkey parks that John Knight has described um, uh, are similar to the ones that we encountered. So um, in Japan, all the tourists, so, so here to give context for people who weren't with us this weekend, um, you walk into a monkey temple and you're given a big stick. <laughs> and you're told to hit the monkey if it comes too close. You're told to feed the monkey if you want to, but um, here's a stick and hit the monkey if it charges at you. And if um, you're really serious, you pay 30 baht and you get a slingshot and the monkeys are really scared. Of this. And these are Buddhist monks. You're telling you, hit the monkey, hit the monkey. Um, so in, in Japan, um, it's, it's kind of the temple guards that all have the sticks. And if you're a tourist um, and you have food, like if one of those guards isn't around, you're likely to get mobbed. Like monk at these different sites, um, John Knight has, has thought about um, how the outcomes of interactions, and this is something I mentioned when we were together, it's, it's not just dyads interacting, like it's not just the tourist and the monkey or big monkey and small monkey, it's the tourist, the monkey, and the temple guard, or it's, you know, the baby monkey, alpha female, and beta male. Like if it's just the baby, beta male and the, the little baby monkey, like maybe he's gonna try to get away with it and, and break the social norms. 
So, so here, you know, one of the specificities, so there's been a lot of great ethnochromatology work done at these various sites in Southeast Asia, you know, also lovely stuff in, in India that's been done. And, and I think we're in a moment where one of the big stories that we're living with of our time, the emergence of the coronavirus pandemic is entangled with these encounters all of a sudden. And the particular places that we visited that have bats, that have monkeys, that have multiple other species, like we can not only think about them as a contact zone where we're observing these affects and play on kind of a, a visceral physical level, the level that we can readily perceive and understand, but if we can also think about invisible microbes as, as something that's co-present in these encounters, you know, with those sticks, one of the things I, I was just thinking, like the stick is a microbial contact zone. It was kind of nasty. The one that I was given when I walked in the door, you know, people are putting it on the ground where there's monkey poo and all kinds of other things. And, you know, it's, it's, it, it felt like, you know, that was part of the encounter too. Um, so I think, yeah, there's, there's a particularity of, of the bats, the monkeys, the microbes that I think is going to make for a really innovative contribution to this to this growing literature and ethnoprimatology that adds some some new species some new dimensions um, that other people haven't worked on so do you think um if the people don't they didn't interact with the monkey in the first place where the monkey would be interested in hanging around like uh, with people like going to the shop or house and the food and if people didn't like I don't know the act of the monkey in the first place they didn't like throw food and stuff monkey would be just a with their own right and you know, like on their own. So, so the rhesus macaques of Florida are really good at situational awareness. They're able to distinguish uh, kayakers from motorboat. Uh, you know, they've, they've learned that they, they're actually not that interested in kayaks. Like if a big motorboat comes by with a big engine, like that's the buzz that gets, that gets them all excited. Um, we watch how like motorboaters like often come with these big barrel peanuts and bananas and are just chucking things. Um, and, uh, you know, when we would be there, they wouldn't really pay as much attention unless we unwrapped some food. They, they, they knew what the sound of a like plastic wrapper was, like that, you know, that we carry these things that are wrapped in food and that plastic wrapper was the signal for them to start paying attention and, and, and watching. Um, and, and I think, you know, based on what I was able to see in Florida, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different groups, like some, are just off, you know, in the forest, and they really don't care about these contact zones where they might be able to get high value food, but also high excitement, high anxiety. I mean, these these encounters, I, I would imagine, are all kinds of, you know, all kinds of conflicts, social conflicts, are emerging uh, amongst them as as these prized food items emerge. Um, so, so yeah, I, I would imagine that. Um, it's all situation dependent and that in many contexts, um, you know, if there's an opportunity to exploit, they will see if there's a way to do it. But if those opportunities disappear, like the, the kind of, you know, Bateson talks about learning about learning, like learning about the context of your knowledge. So if they, you know, early in life associate people with food, they learn to associate like different kinds of people, different kinds of food, or, you know, different kinds of boats with the likelihood of getting food. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of meta awareness about um, when these kinds of interactions with people are, are fruitful and, and when they can just turn away and ignore people and engage in, in you know, other, other kinds of activities that are more interesting or more fruitful. All oh, right. Hello, Julieta. Where are you? Are you there, Julieta? Do you have a question? I am here. I am here. 
And yes, I do. One sec. Uh, we can't hear you. I think you're muted. Well, no, I am unmuted. I am unmuted. Okay, no, yeah, it's, it was our speaker. We turned it off, okay. but now we, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so just give me a second. I don't know what I did, but I did something bad um, to my, to my, yes, okay. Uh, so, um, I mean, you, as you know, um, I, I've been working with monkeys for a while. I'm quite interested in them. I started working with monkeys when I ran into the infinite monkey, uh, monkey theorem, which is this proposition that says that if you, everybody probably knows it, that if you give a monkey a typewriter over the course of infinity, the monkey will type every single um, literary work. Um, which I, it's, and it's, which is used to um, differentiate probability from possibility. And now, uh, what I'm interested, interested in there is in the monkey performing label. And I was thinking about the, um, I mean, like my, of the many encounters with monkeys I have had, I, I have two instances that I, um, that I find pertinent at the moment. One is in Japan visiting the snow monkey sanctuary where you are allowed to, I mean, like you have to climb a mountain and it's kind of like a uh, trek intensive. You can enter and I mean, you can be fairly close to the monkeys because they are not, um, uh, you know, there are no barriers to them, but the, you, you are not allowed to interact in anything else but physical proximity, no feeding, no nothing. And the monkeys understand that they are boss. They really are going about their business and you know taking baths and doing their monkey things with little regards for humans. They don't even want your um, camera. Yeah, like they are not in the least interested in your in your goodies. Um, and now in Mexico, in the parts of Mexico where there are monkeys, they they have completely integrated into the tourist economy. So they do want your camera, your cigarettes. They drink Coca Cola on cue. They perform this. Um, anthropomorphic uh, tricks where they kiss your hand, they hug you, they kiss your cheek, they curtsy for um, uh, the ladies. And so, um, and you can take a photograph with them for an X amount of money. So I, what I'm wondering there is if the monkeys understand that they are performing labor in those instances. Do they understand? Oh. Yeah, I mean, I, my, you know, like, it's kind of like, it's not happening all the, the entire day. The tourists show up at nine and they leave at six. So something changes in the day of the monkeys, right? They, at nine, something starts to happen and that ends, like the work day ends. So I'm just pondering what, how does that uh, integrate into this, you know, into the day to day of a monkey? Like a labor awareness. Yeah, I think I, I would look at it um, with that same, you know, uh, the same comment I made about kind of the the meta frame for you know understanding um, interactions. Like, yeah, understanding that in certain contexts, certain kinds of people might expect a particular um, performance to take place. Um, yeah, I think I think Bateson could be helpful mm -hmm. for thinking about. Um, learning about those contexts for interactions with people. And, and yeah, what you were saying, I, I, I think there's there's many situations where um, people are co-present with monkeys and, and there's not a mutual interest. Um, again, in Bali, Augustine Fuentes has described how um, monkeys and tour guides are often occupying a similar subject position, waiting for the tourists to arrive. They're basically hanging out in the parking lot, not really interacting, but just being co-present. Um, like occasionally, like, you know, one, a person will throw a monkey something, but it's not like the intensity of interaction. So they're basically like in this, this state of expectation, like, like wait, anticipating the tourists right, arriving. So, you know, maybe there's there's a similar thing going on in, in Mexico. I mean, it's more it's mostly about imagining, you know, what happens, I mean, at least for me, that's interesting. What happens at 6 p.m. You know, when the when the tourists are gone? And obviously at some point the monkeys internalize the that kind of uh, rhythm. 
So what kind of shift, you know, like do they go home after work? You know, like I, I just have kind of like this kind of Im uh, imagination of like, how is that perceived? I mean, like, because it breaks the, and what happens on the days when the park is closed? Yeah, Do they still go to the parking, um, you, you know, to the, to the tourist attraction to wait for the tourists even though on that particular day, like Mondays is closed or something, yeah? Like how does that affect the rhythm? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if anyone has looked into that kind of thing. Like it's, uh, yeah, like the, the, I mean, like the awareness of labor, is, is it labor, is it play, like that kind of thing. It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, something I've been pondering for years now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a question from Emily. Uh, Mike's not working, so I'll write. I have a question about the concept of wildness. In your book and the talk just then, you mentioned wild animals flourish with the freedom from controlled proximity with humans. We can say about the same. We can say the same about humans. That is, humans feel okay with the monkey's wildness as long as there is a safe distance. I wonder if you can comment on situations during your research when wildness turns sour or where the safe relational network fails. What would happen to the usefulness of wildness then? Thanks. So, so Emily, I'd, I'd um, point not only to some of the stuff I've written, um, I've, I've got a piece uh, called uh, Living Machines Go Wild um, that uh, is um, basically looking at, at microbes that are um, in that space of, of, of the new wild that Sarah Franklin des describes. So I, I, th I think Sarah Franklin's done a really good job of um, uh, uh, engaging with that. There's also a book that I just read called Cloning Wild Life. Um, but in, in this, this piece of, um, of mine about um, these, these student enterprises. So there's an annual comp competition called iGEM the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition, where um, the machine metaphor is um, kind of reverse engineered. So Kangulem describes, you know, as of 1952, I think is when he publishes the essay about how um, machines have changed over time. And, you know, in Descartes' day, it was like the waterworks and the windmill was, was used to, as a metaphor to understand animals. And then Later, the clock was developed, and you know, people assumed that um, animals work like clockwork or like automata. But but in the last 20, 30 years, um, there's been like this biomimicry um, uh, sensibility in in um, engineering departments, and this idea that you can build these machines out out of living parts. Um, uh, so so they're they're trying to take the organism and and turn it. Make, make it into a machine um, to do the, the bidding of humans. And um, yeah, in this essay, I was, I was tra tracing the ways, and, and these are student projects. So you, so you basically come up with an idea. It's like a year long cycle, you know, like um, you sign up for iGEM, you brainstorm ideas. The students on my campus wanted to create um, photosynthetic people that would be able to lay on the beach and, and soak up green, you know, have green skin and soak up sun and not have to eat anymore. Um, so they found um, in the iGEM registry, a team in Poland had taken E. coli bacteria, inserted uh, plague toxin and um, Listeria toxin that let the E. coli selectively invade um, human tissue. And they thought, this is great. We'll just put those, those toxin genes in cyanobacteria We'll have these cyanobacteria photosynthetic life forms invade human skin, and it'll be awesome. And everyone will, you know, in eight months, we'll have solved world hunger. Um, <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> and um, it, instead, what happened is they got in the mail a living microbe that wasn't well understood, but this Polish team of undergrads had shown that using cell cultures in a lab that. Um, yeah, actually you can get these E. coli to invade human cells and live inside. That's cool, we did science. Um, you know, this is before the Wuhan, you know, lab leak hypothesis, but um, yeah, I, I guess the kinds of relational wildness that we might think about in 
again, these kind of levels that we can see and apprehend with, with, with our senses might play out also in these domains of biotechnology. Um, so there's always this imaginary of, of like the human, the human entrepreneur, like Bruno Latour's actor network theory is premised on the idea of interest mind. You in, interpret the needs and interests of, of agents and enlist them in a, in, in a network. But I, I think this machine metaphor really breaks down. These microbes, you know, get rid of the genes that they don't want. They get rid of the, um, they're, they're not following the engineering manual of, of the undergraduate students. They're, they're kind of doing their own thing. So as much as you might try to be that, that, that um, person who's stabilizing the network, they're veering off on, on lines of, of flight and disrupting the human visions, the human goals. So, so I guess um, I, I think about um, these relationships where wildness has these potentialities maybe with, with the work of, of Charlotte Brevis, uh, a, a French anthropologist who's written about uh, viruses. So, so she talks about viral symbioses as not just being good or bad, like, you know, a, a, a something that can, um, a, a virus in some circumstances can help its host flourish, but it can also have detrimental health impacts. But she, she also introduces the idea of pluripotentiality to, to think about um, these, these relationships. So, so I guess, yeah, for me, that wildness can be pluripotent. You know, it, it can, um, I, I think wildness characterizes so many different things, these domains of autonomy, but also this, this um, unruly liveliness and uh, so, so yeah, I, I guess for me, it's, it's a useful idea to think about um, the failure of biopolitics or the failure of um, regimes of power or capital accumulation that are just simply trying to optimize life. Like wildness is, is something that disrupts these human dreams and schemes. That was kind of a long rambly all over the place response to your question. Stella, do you want to ask your question? I can turn on my sound, so that's the problem. Oh, right. Okay. So you want me to do you want to come read your question to my I, I thing? I could work through some of the events, but um, okay. The lines have been in space. Um yeah, I can read from anybody's, I guess. Come over here, you can all right. All right. Taylor Oh wait, this is really weird. Hi everybody, sorry to be, uh, sorry for all the tech issues. We're in a completely different space from where we normally work. Um, I wanted to thank Evan obviously for this amazing, rich and brilliant talk, uh, along with all the guidance he's been giving our Elmer Moody Lab students. And I guess I wanted to get, uh, since we have him here and he knows so much more about these things, to, um, to ask you Evan to lay out some more of the connections and some of the conceptual background and also the workings of these different conceptions of wildness. Um, you talked about them in relation to racialized assemblages and a bit in relation to gender. And as you know, a lot of thinking has been done about how constructions of masculinity through uh, encounters with frontiers or ideas of the wilderness um, have emerged uh, you know, under modernity. And, I'd like it if you could elaborate on the ways in which these racialized, gendered, Western, modern notions of nature, capital N, and I'm putting it in quotes to problematize it, how they emerged after a shift that Carolyn Merchant has uh, described, if you agree with it, from a more organicist, animist conception of nature as more chaotic and having agency uh, that, that was recognized to a, um, an enlightenment era mechanistic conception that treats everything that is categorized as nature, categorized through what Bell Plumwood has talked about as hierarchical dualisms, um, which treat nature then as, they sh it strips out the agency, treats it as mute, passiveless, agentless, uh, sort of material to be molded by human interests for human desires, for human needs, to be exploited and extracted. Um, and sort of, thinking about how that, that process 
of shifting the ways in which we understand uh, our relationship to the natural world, what this concept of nature is, because we talked about it a bit before, um, and how ideas now in this era in which the traces of and residues of this enlightenment thinking of sort of mechanistic idea of nature persist in many ways in like development discourses, for example. Um, how do ideas of wilderness and wildness and becoming wild relate to ideas of development and domestication uh, in the bigger picture of this dominant mechanistic conception of nature as a background environment, a container for man, the master of nature or a stage on which the human performs himself into being, and how can multi-species studies be a rejoinder and a response or mediation to these problematic conceptions that have had such enormous real world practical material institutional organizational implications for how the entire world is ordered. And I'm sure you have a million things to say about these issues. So can we just get some of your thoughts on some of that stuff? So rather than my thoughts, I'd like to plug an older book. It's called Rodeo, An Anthropologist Takes a Look at the Wild and the Tame by Elizabeth Atwood Lawrence. And this is a feminist exploration of cowboy culture on, on the white settler frontier of the United States. Um, she's interested in, in these men who call their sport more than a way of life, than a way to make a living. And, um, you, you know, she's, she's getting inside of the, the masculinist frontier visions about, you know, taming nature, taming the Indians, um, uh, this uh, stylized expression, uh, you know, winning the West is this expression of uh, frontier attitudes uh, related to both man and nature. Um, she describes how rodeo contestants are the modern counterparts of the rugged individualistic cowboys. They in, embody this ethos uh, that's uh, marked by an ambivalence. They ad admire the wild and the free, and still they desire to tame and conquer. And I, I think you see kind of that ambivalence in John Daniels, that, that guy who tells the racist joke, that guy who's involved in the animal trapping. On the one hand, like he's, he's there, to tame the wildness of the invasive species as he sees it. Um, and, and I think there's a, you know, the xenophobia of his racism is like, you know, paralleling how he's how he's viewing these, these animals and plants out of out of place. Um, you know, he's he's nostalgic for this this time almost when he didn't belong. Like he, there's a real romance there for for the the Indian way of life, the Lucy shell, shell mounds are a big part of his discourse. And I think he's appreciative of the ways that the whole civilizational project disrupted that. So, so there's like a longing to return to what was destroyed by this, this whole front frontier imaginary. Um, and, and yeah, there's a specificity to the masculinist virility, you know, riding the bucking bronco, wrestling the alligator, like, you know, killing the black boy, like this, this all kind of goes together. And um, yeah, it's, it's a sort of white male, you know, virility that's, that's manufactured on the frontier. So, you know, this book was published in 1981. That's a long time ago, but I, I really want to give it a plug. I don't know what Elizabeth Atwood Lawrence is up to today, but, or if she, she's even still around. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd really just like to celebrate that book. Well, another book that fits in with that vein is by Monica Rico, who's an environmental historian and one of my old friends, who's written, I think it's called Nature's Nobleman, and thinking about, again, sort of constructions of a certain emerging notion of masculinity through encounters with a, an idea of a wilderness that one tames and domesticates, and through that process becomes a man. And then Anand Singh has recently critiqued uh, Farrell, George Mon, is it Monbiot? Monbiot? Monbiot, yeah, 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 yeah Monbiot, has yeah, George. That for being a much more maybe contemporary and sophisticated, mm -hmm. but a sort of reimagining a little bit of those tropes, um, you know, that we become real men when we're out in nature, you know, in the elements, of, and that there are some problematic ways in which that continues the colonial project and doesn't really respect kind of multi-species potentiality 
that I think open species studies supports and us and trains us to become more attentive to or maybe able to embody in different ways, perhaps. Yeah, and I'd also like to point to the Australian ecofeminist traditions. So we've mentioned Deborah Bird Rose a, a couple of times, but yeah, also Val Plumwood. So Val's um, what 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 um, she was uh, became famous for um, was almost getting eaten by a crocodile and um, refusing some of the refusing a lot of the predictable tropes that get mobilized in those kinds of encounters. So there was a, a ranger who came to save her, and you know. The, there was a media circus around that moment and and she refused to engage for a while and then wrote this very thoughtful essay about becoming prey and about less um you know taming the wild animal but recognizing so, sort of undoing human exceptionalism through that encounter recognizing herself as meat as as through the crocodile's eye in the eye of the crocodile you know val wasn't a being worthy of regard. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's a, great, a, a great text. And um, I've also got a PhD student, uh, Zoe Kuhn, who's, who's fi finishing up a intellectual history of Val Plumwood. She's basically dwelled in um, Val's homestead and done an intellectual archeology span of like, there's everything from these floppy disks to like letters to like, you know, old laptop computers to, um books that have mice running around them and, and paper with mold <laughs> uh, yes 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 okay blake we have a raised hand from Samantha. okay that, that's a gun. okay yeah i don't know i thought you had to leave if he's still here that would be great let's see yes can you hear me yes uh, just to add some of the some bit of information about Mangi in Thailand. I think it's also uh, useful to really trace the changes that occur during these few decades of monkeys in, in Robley, for instance, because, you know, this locally revered pet of God of a local shrine turned into tourist attractive. But they, Wait. Uh... Okay. Is it okay? Should I keep going? Go ahead. We, we just figured out that. Okay. Uh, just, yeah, just to want to point out that uh, there is also changes during the course of decades of this uh, locally tourist place where they are, there's called the hub of monkey or the place where there are a lot of monkey and tourists visiting them in the course of some a few decades it's turned from being locally revered pet of god in a local uh, rune into tourist attractive where people would go and feed them they even have a chinese uh, feeding ceremony to uh, let all these monkey go to the to the almost like a, a feast and then in the past few years, especially after the COVID-19, where uh, really few tourists visited the place, there are not enough food for monkeys to, to, to be just there. So it starts to invade local people's domestic, domestic, domestic spaces. And uh, it, it becomes so severe that a lot of, of local traders just want to just move away from the town, you know? So it's not that it's totally being domesticated, but it, the wideness of, of the monkey itself 
is also a threat to local tourists after this pandemic situation. That is one thing. So, you know, it's probably a useful way to look at how this also evolve and change between uh, different uh, situations. The second thing is that there is also some uh, multi-species relationship between, for instance, monkeys in Lopoli in Thailand and stray dogs in, in the province. So they have this interesting relationship between them, like because they are ruling, they are two different group of monkey, and they are they are fighting each other. They are they are almost like uh, monkey gangsters in, in, in local town. So they're fighting each other. And dog the dogs stray dogs in the province have to adapt to the situation of these two rivaling gang of monkeys. You know, that, that's, that is also quite interesting. A study in, in India also made use of the concept of metabolism to look at how action or the activities of monkeys related to food and tourist activities, for instance, like what happened after 6 p.m., you know, so the activity seems to be related to some form of metabolism or food supply, you know, or human metabolism, how it relates to monkeys' metabolism as well. So these are a few things that, that I would like to add to. I'm not an expert on monkey or anything, just to add some local bit of information about it. Thank you. So thanks for sharing. And, and I might just riff on that last uh, idea of me metabolism. You know, so, so we have the idea of the metabolic rift from Marx. And um, recently I've seen some really interesting work that's emerged during the pandemic, thinking about um, the metabolic rift that kind of reverberates in, in human bodies. So part of what, um, you know, makes people susceptible to COVID is um, metabolic damage from the uh, modern industrial food system, you know, uh, metabolic disorders like diabetes and, um, you know, obesity are, are a product of, of these industrial supply chains. And, and I wonder, um, yeah, if that metabolic rift is starting to reverberate into some of these primate communities too, um, one of the things that um, really stood out to me from this this monkey temple that we just visited um, was it yesterday two days ago? There were some really fat monkeys, and yeah. you know they're eating the same bad food as as um, as we are. And um, also thinking about your comment, um, I've, I've I've heard about this this yeah this monkey problem. Um, uh, in uh, uh, I'm, I, we've got the name. Lim, how do you say it again? Lim oh, Low pudding. Um, and, you know, we, we heard about similar kind of eras of scarcity um, uh, during COVID for these, these monkeys living at the Buddhist temples. Um, although it, it did seem like, um, you know, there, there, was, there was a concerted effort um, at, at certain moments in the pandemic. Like the, the abbot told us that, um, you know, the monkeys were definitely getting hangry. They were getting more unruly and more aggressive because the tourists weren't coming. But I, I think there was a renewed sense um, from the broader community um, that not only did donations need to get uh, renewed to the temple and to help, help the monks and the, the neophytes, but there was a real sense from the community that, um, that the monkeys needed to be sustained during, during the pandemic. Um, so, so we found a lot of people who were kind of making money in this multi-species contact zone, um, you know, selling things like ice cream, like sugary drinks, um, you know, fried tofu, various kinds of vendors right in, in the entrance to, to the temple. So some of them were had feelings of great affection towards the monkeys. Others um, were very ambivalent. Some even deeply hostile, <laughs> you know, and some, some were making their money by selling slingshots. So, so I think, you know, some are kind of leaning into the ambivalences of, of these multi-species encounters, um, you know, having to be hyper vigilant. So um, we were basically, um, after meeting with the abbot who, you know, sort of gave us the, the broad ground rules of how to interact and not interact with the monkeys, we decided to eat some food outside of the temple and just have a little picnic lunch. 
And uh, as, as the lunch was wrapping up, there was a, a big male monkey who decided that he wanted to join the picnic. Um, but then, all, you know, there was at least two of the vendors who came over, like we had our sticks there, but that wasn't enough. They were like, no, you really have to hit the monkey to, to actually be able to in, enjoy your food. So there's this constant policing of boundaries, the negotiation, the transgression of boundaries, the pushing back. And um, yeah, I think that's what makes this this site a, a really interesting one, and I think one that we'll keep returning to. So, really, really good to see you again. Um, thank you for the question, and I'm um, looking forward to to staying in touch. That's right. Uh, no last words for me other than just a big, uh, you know, uh, feeling of thanks. It's been really generative to kind of, you know, this is older research that I did, um, you know, two books ago. It's, it's nice to kind of take it out of the archives and give it a new life um, in this new context. So, so I think it'll be really fun to to work on this together and um yeah thank thank you all for the very smart questions um who've, who've joined remotely and uh it's it's been a great dialogue do, do you want to say anything aria or, or stella i don't have the mic i'm going to turn it over to you just a, a, a brief word from you folks just to sum up sort of <laughs> and, and, and cap this off um, since we had some adventure together <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so uh, just very briefly, uh, hopefully everyone can see and hear me, uh, just really briefly on uh, behalf of the lab uh, and um, uh, everyone here, uh, really appreciate uh, Dr. Kirksey coming to join us, uh, being so intellectually generous, uh, offering uh, you know, guidance on uh, this project and many other projects throughout the, uh, the week that he's been here. Um, and of course, for the uh, the talk today, which was very informative and, uh, and deeply interesting. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Sorry about the sound issues. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs>